Hello and welcome to the Festival of Urbanism. Thanks for joining us for this event, New Industrial Urbanism, Designing Places for Production. I'm Professor Carl Grodock, uh, and I'll be the discussant for the event today. Um, I'm also the festival co-organizer as well. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land and waters where I speak from today. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, as well as the traditional owners of the lands where you ever might be joining us from today. Uh, the Festival of Urbanism is co-sponsored by the University of Sydney's Henry Halloran Research Trust and Monash Urban Planning Design. And this is the ninth Festival of Urbanism. We have events running through September 23rd, um, here in Melbourne, Sydney, and online uh, around our theme, Future Urbanism. And I think my uh, speaker with us today, Professor Tali Hatuka, and her, her topic is um, really great fit for our, our program. Uh, and I am really excited to have her. Um, I'm going to give a little background uh, on our speaker, and then I will hand over the floor to her. Um, Professor Hatuka is an architect and urban planner. She's professor of urban planning and the head of the Laboratory of Contemporary Urban Design at Tel Aviv University. She's the author of multiple books, including The Design of Protest, Violent Acts, and Urban Space in Contemporary Tel Aviv, and most recently, New Industrial Urbanism, Designing Places for Production, which she'll be speaking about today. Uh, she also works as a city planner and urban designer and has received many awards, including a Fulbright Scholarship at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Hatuka was chosen in 2020 to be one of the markers 100 most influential people in Israel for her academic and practical work in urban planning. Welcome, Tali Hatuka. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for this kind of uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to, for you know this uh, talk and uh, for exposing the, the work we have done on industrial development over the last decade or so. Um, let me uh, okay. Somehow the pro I have a problem with the presentation. Let me sorry about that. It doesn't move now for some reason. Okay, sorry about that. So New Industrial Urbanism is actually a project I've been working with my uh, colleague, uh, Aram Ben Joseph uh, from MIT over the last decade. Uh, it's uh, a project that um, uh, is actually accumulation and many, many different insights based on um, practice, research, and uh, empirical studies that uh, we've done in different parts of the world. And for us, it was very important to kind of accumulate all these insights and bring it together in this book. Uh, it's actually an open access book, free for downloading. Um, and um, what it is all about. Technology, clearly you probably heard a, a lot about it over the last uh, week, uh, it's actually changing our life, but our focus in this particular book was it's actually on particular dimension of technological innovation uh, and how particularly, particularly it's influencing uh, industry and how in turn it's changing cities and design. There are two premises that are important to emphasize uh, in this book. First, that we perceive manufacturing is as crucial and very important for city growth. And secondly, that we think that there is a need to cultivate varied socio-spatial strategies that can support both manufacturing, but also the various social groups in the city. So for us, this project is not just about physical development, it's also about uh, future society. New industrial urbanism is not a model. Uh, the, the departure point of this book is uh, that uh, we need to reassess the relationship between cities, people, and industry. And what we try to offer is a sort of socio-spatial concept that um, bring these three dimensions together. 
We suggest shaping cities with renewed understanding that an urban location and setting give industry a competitive advantage thanks to the success to skilled labor, educational institutions, and customers. So as a whole, this concept calls for reassessing, rethinking, and uh, a paradigm shift in the way we understand and address production in cities and regions. Actually, we believe that cities that will embrace this uh, now will benefit more both in terms of uh, social resiliency, environmental resiliency, and also economic growth. So what is in the book? Uh, the first part is actually gives a sort of introduction to the whole process of uh, industri industrial development from historical perspective. But just to have uh, a clue about what we address when we say the fourth industrial revolution, uh, maybe we will see a short film that kinds of give us an overview of the different four industrial revolutions from uh, late 19th century till today. So, uh, Carl, I would like to ask you now to share with us the, the film, if possible. Carl? this is fine. Uh, now I'm going back to my uh, presentation and I just want to come back to the question why now? So the fourth industrial revolution definitely brings many many opportunities but it also uh, brings many challenges and for us it's very important to uh, to think how these changes are actually going to influence cities. Um, so if you look at this from architectural uh, perspective, we can see that uh, factory spaces uh, have been changed tremendously since uh, early 19th century till today. And if it's early 19th century factory was just a production space with a single use, today we think can see the development of many factories as very complex ecosystems. They include many different amenities, uh, public amenities, green, and so forth. So the whole idea of uh, design and program of factories has been changed tremendously. Of course, here we just I just uh, put it on the, on the, um, some arbitrary uh, cases, but uh, there are many new ideas in developing industrial. Uh, spaces. Another thing that we see are the expansion of building types in hosting work spaces and manufacturing. And uh, of course, uh, the more traditional street, but nowadays we see campuses, boxes, towers, they are all organized in a city in a very complex way. We can find, a, we can find different types of typologies in different places. But more importantly, when we go to the planning perspective, we can see how a planning has always been responsive and responded to the different industrial revolutions. So 
of course, the first industrial revolution, we didn't have uh, a plan or a model to address the, the, the changes of water, steam power and mechanization. But later on with the second industrial revolution, we see the emergence of garden city, company towns and zoning. In the 70s, with the third industrial revolution, uh, specifically with computerization and automation, we see the development of the uh, industrial parks. And nowadays, what we see, and this is like the focus of the book, this trend of uh, creating hybrid, complex, integrated uh, industrial areas within the city. The question, of course, is not just what next, but how we address the uh, fourth industrial revolution, how we develop planning mechanisms and strategies that would support the changes that we have just uh, seen in this short film, and how we actually going to support both society, environment, economy, and of course, try to give some solution in planning and architecture. So these kind of patterns and order uh, in terms of how a geography, how a industry is spread all over cities and region has also been changing. So traditionally, of course, the more polluting industrial areas were placed as autonomous areas in the country uh, and uh, the central business district integrated into uh, the city uh, core. And uh, this kind of three prototypes of autonomous industrial uh, park adjacent in proximity to the city industrial area and the integrated industrial area are now being uh, reassessed, rethought in many cities all over the world. So many, many cities actually ask themselves, policymakers, planners, ask themselves today, does contemporary manufacturing have the same spatial need as in the past? Should it be subject to the same rules and zoning regulation? Uh, and I'm saying that, uh, many, many cities all over the world because one of the ideas that uh, comes again and again in different uh, places is that uh, manufacturing and industry is not just uh, an issue of the global south. Many Western countries are now actually reshoring uh, industries back, back to, to their country, to the, to the city. So um, in addressing this very kind of broad planning question, there are a few challenges that we need to take into, uh, that we need to bear in mind. And there are a few questions in uh, design and planning that we have to address. So first, the challenges, we have, have four key challenges. First, when we think about industry today, we have to think about globalization, competition, between cities and regions, it's not just you know developing um, an industrial area. The second issue is of course society, the skills, the social capital, and the unemployment effect that have been uh, taking place in many many Western countries, but also in the global South as part of the globalization processes. Planning. Uh, demographic growth, rapid urbanization, again in different parts of the world, and how actually we can use these uh, changes of the fourth industrial revolution in order to support new strategies and environment. I don't think we ha I have to say much about the environment dilemmas and challenges in Australia. There are so many issues in associated with environment and industry, including consumption and the cost of energy in transportation of goods. How does this refer to our field, urban planning and architecture? So actually all these things coming together, I think pose three key questions. The first is strategies. What physical planning and design strategies should cities pursue to retain and track and increase manufacturing activity? In terms of regulation, maybe Carl is one of the experts to this and we can further discuss this later on, is the question, should contemporary manufacturing be subjected to the same rules and zoning regulation as its uh, predecessors? And design, what criteria should be should we consider when we design in flexible new industrial areas? So these kind of challenges and questions were the departure point for uh, examining studying different places of making all over the world. So when we did this uh, around Ben Joseph and myself, we looked at multiple cases. Uh, not all of them are in the book, but what we came up 
are uh, is with three key approaches that we found that are really uh, taking place in various places: clustering, regenerating, and hybrid hybridity or forming hybrid districts. I will say a few words on each of these approach uh, approaches and say something about the things that we need to think about them. Uh, you know, together. So I will present them separately, but it doesn't mean that cities do not use like clustering and regenerating simultaneously, but just for the clarification of the of the discussion. So what is clustering? Clustering is actually not a new uh, approach, but I think that uh, what's important about it is how it is being perceived today. So cluster refers to grouping of similar things or people, position or carrying closely together. Although clusters are often presented in terms of global creativity and communication, they are very much rooted in particular places. So when we looked at different cases, what we understood is that of course, the physicality of clustering is very, very strong. We see in clustering agglomeration benefits, we see how the design support proximity between different uh, companies and institutions. We see how clustering is very much based on uh, mobility infrastructure and so on. But all this physical development is supported heavily by other policies. In, and most particularly, uh, it is based on the triple helix, a, a, a particular model of man management that is connecting the academia, government, and the private sector. Without this, physicality is an mean anything. In addition to uh, the physical design and the management, there is the issue of culture, again, supported by various policies. Uh, the culture of clustering is very much associated with uh, diversity, both in company, but also in, in terms of uh, society. It usually uh, give a membership uh, privileges and uh, is very much based on knowledge exchange. So there are many, many parameters that actually support in clustering. Clustering is not just a physical uh, approach. Uh, it's actually much more complex than that. But in terms of physicality, this is something which is important to say. When we look at clustering, we can find like very rural clustering, successful clustering in, uh, let's say, at the left, we can see Netherlands, the Food Valley in uh, the Netherlands, which is very much rural autonomous uh, agglomeration. Uh, and then we can also see in the right, a uh, candle square uh, in Cambridge, which is urban, diffuse, integrated in the city. This is to say that clustering doesn't have necessarily a scale and it can take place in the very much urban uh, environment, but also in the rural environment. So two key points that uh, were to mention uh, about clustering. First, that clustering is not just, again, physical process, it's actually a political process and it does not suit all situations. The clustering approach requires concentration of specialized activity, collaborating with research or educational institutions, interacting with complementary industries and or services, and having access to skilled labor pool. Furthermore, clustering is a process and it is based on institutional building, partnership, and funding. What is also important to understand is clustering is about nurturing a social spatial ecosystem. That is that you have the educational system that uh, develop and nurture uh, skilled labor. There is a whole culture around this uh, socio-spatial ecosystem. And as I said before, hypothetically, cluster can evolve anywhere in a rural, semi-urban, or a dense urban environment. But clustering is very contextual. It's not something that you can actually copy paste and it to great extent rely on the human capital and community. The second strategy that we see in many, many uh, cities all over the world is regenerating. Uh, reinventing, rejuvenating, and regenerating are concepts that promote processes that boost existing uses and reverse possible urban decline by improving uh, physical infrastructure, protecting and enhancing current land use and building on urban character of industrial areas. I want to emphasize regenerating in that sense doesn't mean just beautifying the, the, the sites, but regenerating the industrial uses. It's not regenerating in general. 
and again, here, what we see in different cases, of course, uh, in terms of physical and design strategies, mix of uses, uh, supporting mobility infrastructure, emphasize on heritage and high quality design. We will see in a minute some diagrams, but here again, management is very, very uh, crucial in enhancing and uh, supporting these processes and uh, and growth. Uh, and in particular, I want to emphasize that in all the cases that we looked at uh, in regenerating uh, processes, the involvement of citizens are crucial and stakeholders are crucial to the success of the project. So when we look at diagrams, uh, we can see that regenerating obviously takes place in a different scale. In most cases, uh, regeneration is uh, integrated into the existing uh, urban environment. We can see that uh, in many, many cases, excluding Singapore, all these processes are uh, both top-down and bottom-up uh, processes. Uh, usually, there are um, organization and uh, community-led initiatives, and there is a support from the government. <coughs> um, but what you can see in the diagrams is that uh, they're very much focusing on the public amenities and in creating industrial areas within the city that's actually behave, look like, and being supported like a residential environment. This does not mean that we have a lot of uh, residential uh, in this type of uh, processes, but rather that it imitates the strategies and the design approach of uh, residential areas. So a few points about regenerating. Uh, there is no such thing a vacuum in the city. <clears throat> the neglected and abundant sites are filled with new actors and uses. And nowadays, again, cities are very much um, aware of this and trying to maintain and keep these sites as industry and manufacturing. Um, building on what already exists, the regeneration is based on three tiers, management, sustainability, and conservation. The first tier, management, is central to industrial reinvention processes, as I said before. The second, of course, the encourages of mixed uses, but this again does not mean residential. We will talk about it in the hybridity uh, model, um, but it's actually promoting green environmental strategies and integration of high quality design, specifically public amenities. <coughs> and the third here is conservation maintaining a sense of heritage and place by taking uh, an approach that actually um, supports both the urban economy, but also the reinvention of the place and its identity. Hybridity is the last uh, approach that we see very much uh, um, growing over the last uh, few years. And uh, if regeneration was still very much focused on uh, the industry, hybridity is actually everything. Uh, it's about encouraging the creation of heterogeneous environments that include diverse activities in industrial areas. This process supported by the rapid development of information technologies has broad social and environmental effects and influence planning policies and actually has been further accelerated uh, by COVID. And uh, I think there were many, many uh, articles that address this particular approach. So here again, uh, in terms of physical approach, there is the preservation and enhancement of existing assets, uh, flexibility, mixed requirements and regulation, and it's sort of a patchwork. Uh, we will see in a minute, but it is an environment that has both residential, manufacturing, public amenities, everything, in the same place, uh, it could take place even in the same building. In terms of culture, these environments are very much uh, focused on community, live work typologies, affordable housing. So the whole idea is to create a very complex, heterogeneous environment, socially, physically, and economically. 
usually, of course, here as well as all as all uh, as in all of the other uh, approaches, uh, local advocacy and the public-private partnerships play a major role. And of course, government is usually uh, supporting this kind of initiative. So what we see here, this is a good uh, diagram that actually show, again, the different cases that are presented in the book, but uh, they are all zoning maps. And just from the colors, uh, you can uh, see how things are being integrated, but the colors are not actually telling the whole story because in Shenzhen, for example, one building can uh, house everything, both residential, manufacturing, and so on. And uh, this is coming to uh, another dimension with hybridity, uh, and it is the architectural dimension we see <coughs> over the last few years, uh, attempts to develop a uh, new building typologies, which in one complex or even in one building include everything, like includes both the uh, manufacturing spaces, working spaces and uh, residential. So to the right, to the left, we can see a prototype that manufacturing in industry is taking place at the ground level, but in the, uh, right example, we can see actually a building prototype that you can see that uh, part is uh, residential and the other part uh, is industry at the same level. So we see this uh, search and exploration for new ways of integrating uh, industry manufacturing in the city. This is obviously not very easy. And specifically with hybridity, it's important to say a few words. First, uh, hybridity is usually supporting, of course, new economic opportunities and incentive. Uh, again, uh, the fourth industrial revolution brings many, many opportunities, different lifestyle, different kind of skilled labor. It's engaging uh, the stakeholders, it's integrating bottom up and top down approaches. And the whole idea of hybridity is developing flexible a uh, regulatory mechanism to cultivate the social culture of the place. There are two big challenges with hybrid innovation districts that we already see them. First is actually how we protect manufacturing uses, uh, creating a system or creating an environment that does not push, pushes out manufacturing uh, from the district. And the second is how integrating and protecting existing social communities specifically uh, talking about low income and uh, fragile community that sometimes reside in this environment. So when we look at this, uh, all these cases in the book, these are only maps of all the different cases that we explore in the book. We can see that the, the, we are no longer can think about industry separated from uh, the city. In yellow, you can see the different spaces, uh, the different uh, areas that industry located. And in uh, gray, in all the only maps are the residential uh, areas. And you can see that if in the past they were distant, far away, nowadays we have to think not just about how to integrate them, but how industry can live vis-a-vis -vis the residential uh, area and how we can integrate them in a way that would support everyone the residents and the entrepreneurs and the workers. Uh, but when we look at these three type of strategies, um, we can see that although from the perspective of economic development, they are very different from one another, they're all based on two related premises. First, that the industry has been and still is central mechanism for economic growth. And uh, the second is that the economic growth relies on different institutions collaborating and on various stakeholders forming a network. In that sense, physicality is responding to this. Unfortunately, I would love to say that planning and architecture are leading these uh, ideas, but right now, uh, and I'm in this uh, process for a few years now, uh, I can see the economic uh, policy makers and technological uh, innovator are all, you know, heading uh, with these kind of ideas and we are now trying to respond to this. So this is definitely an economic uh, agenda. 
But I think that uh, what we can say about these three approaches, that they are all trying to respond to it and to develop new framework that uh, support the initiatives that come from bottom up. In terms of planning, I can say that all these three approaches are focusing very much on comp compactness, uh, sustainability, resiliency, and connectivity. So they are located within a general framework that we can also, we are familiar with and uh, we are aware of uh, over the last uh, two or three decades now. But uh, what's important is that the whole idea of how to create proximity and how to create these con connectivities is something that we don't know really how to uh, address yet. So uh, the, 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 that part of the book is actually taking all these case studies and trying to summarize this into what we call open manufacturing. Uh, we ask ourselves, okay, so what now? So different cities are doing different things. Um, so we suggested the, the name new industrial urbanism. We see it as the next phase of cities reinventing themselves. This is to say that industrial urbanism is definitely not the way we saw it or perceive it over the last uh, 50 years, but we need to think, it, think about it as a social spatial concept that called for reassessing, as I said before, cities, people, and industry. And what we see is that it, the, the, again, the new industrial urbanism is based on four tiers. First, localization, again, very much enhanced by COVID, the territorial attachment and proximity is a source of competitive advantage for uh, industries that gets involved in the globalization processes. Coordination, uh, industrial sites uh, today are very much being seen as ecosystem that uh, with varied um, institutions supporting one another, knowledge transfer and support are crucial in uh, the success of industrial areas. Localism and community. Uh, I think that in the past, no one really thought about the role or the growing role of local and community, but nowadays it seems that this is a crucial dimension. And uh, planning, uh, we have to think again about how we develop systems that are much more diffuse, much more flexible, uh, updated in terms of regulation, specifically environmentally and socially. And in terms of, again, planning concept and how uh, we need to look forward, I think that nowadays when we think about industrial development, we cannot just look at the particular site. We have to understand it in, uh, from uh, a secular approach that is looking at, even if I design a very small space uh, district in a city, I have to understand it in the regional context and the urban context and think about it as a, an ecosystem. Uh, complexity, connectivity, character are all integrity dimensions that uh, can contribute to the uh, design and success of the, of the industrial area. And of course, the major, major uh, challenge that I, I think Carl also know a lot about it is the coding complexity regulation, how we actually change regulation nowadays that will be more flexible, adaptive, and uh, in, you know, include more standards for, uh, and new standards for environment and uh, so on. And of course, the, the, the new thing that we see more and more are the synchronic typologies that integrate work and live. And uh, in the book, we elaborate a lot that this is of course not all of these four uh, issues are not, uh, could not be found in all the cases. And definitely the new types of building are not uh, relevant for every place and need to be taken uh, cautiously. So all these ideas are more of suggestions, uh, accumulations of insights and ideas that we found, not necessarily again, a model that and need to be uh, implemented and be viewed and seen in every city in the world. And I think that I would like to end with this slide and I would like to remind us uh, again, the diagram in the right that uh, we are in a process. It's another fragment of future history. 
So when we look at the models, uh, the upper part of the diagram of the integrated industry in orange in the city, and then the zoning and then the parks, and now coming back to the city and integrating it back to the city, this is a phase. Uh, we might have industry five, I don't know, and uh, this probably might also influence and change uh, future cities. But what I, I know is that we are now in this phase, we have to look at manufacturing with fresh eyes and to rethink and reimagine industrial urbanism. I think this is a major, major task for designers, planners, and policymakers in the years ahead. But of course, it is one that sure to be bear, to bear fruit and lead better placemaking. So this is just last slide people working, we have to remember again that uh, society is very diverse and we have different types of people, different types of worker. And that's it. I just want to end and say that this is an open access book, as I said before, and thank you again for listening to me and for hosting me. So Carl, the floor is yours. Uh, shall I stop share or? Um. Yeah, sure, why not? I mean, they can stare at our huge heads. <laughs> um, thanks, Tali, that was really great. And we have um, a number of really good questions in the chat. Um, and I think uh, I'll start with the first one here, the sort of burning question. It's very similar to a question I was gonna ask you as well. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, um, one of the side effects of zoning is isolating industrial land slash property values for more expensive uses like residential and therefore maintaining affordability. So in other words, um, that industrial zoning, particularly in cost competitive inner urban areas, kind of puts a ceiling on um, rents and allows, um, you know, manufacturing and other industrial businesses that might otherwise not afford to be there to locate there. Um, did you come across any cases which saw a shift towards mixed use where we'd expect to see a rise in rents, for example, but they also tackled the issue of affordability within those mixed use spaces? Well, thank you for this uh, question, because uh, I have to say that I'm facing this uh, dilemma in actually a project that I'm working on uh, now in the periphery of uh, Israel. Um, so first, I want to put this question in context. It really depends what the, the person who asked this is talking about, whether or not he's talking about uh, city center or central cities or peripheral regions. Uh, so in the periphery, uh, we don't see uh, this competition. We don't see this uh, tenses. But still, uh, what I can see in the different cases that affordability is part of uh, the design strategies and the policies uh, in uh, regenerating uh, industrial areas and specifically in the hybrid approach. So in the book, if uh, this uh, person will look, uh, the hybrid uh, districts usually include uh, affordable approach uh, to housing. So this is again, a very intense tension specifically vis-a-vis, -vis, as I said in, in the presentation itself, of um, tenants that are coming from low income. So it really depends, uh, again, on the policies of the city council. But this is something which is part of the big issues that associate with hybrid uh, approach to uh, industrial districts. Thanks. And I mean, I think, uh... Picking up on some of the issues around that mix is a question towards uh, a more recent question from Felicity in the chat. Um, do you know of any examples of where regulations for mixed use within a building have been done well? Um, I'm particularly interested in planning controls to address noise and vibrations within the built form. Um, again, if you can uh, review the question again, I. Sorry, that's okay. Um, it uh, towards the bottom. It's uh, from Felicity S. Do you know of any examples where regulations for mixed use within a building have been done well? I'm particularly interested in planning controls to address noise and vibrations within the building. Oh right, right, right. Yes, actually, <clears throat> yes. I'm encouraging you again to. I'm promoting the book, but <laughs> I'm encouraging you to look at the book at the case of Canada. 
there is a, a very interesting project uh, that I didn't have time to present it uh, that include uh, manufacturing and industry at the ground level next to uh, train station and uh, residential above. They were very much focusing on environmental noise, all the things that you have been asking. Uh, so if you dive deeply into this project, you will find many, many different solutions in one building. Of course, you can also find other projects in a more complex, so I don't know, in a more uh, complex uh, array of buildings, but this is actually a good example of how you can achieve all these things in one uh, building and uh, next to or adjacent to a train station. So I, I was thinking that this is a very good, successful um, uh, example, uh, we call all these projects syn synchronic typologies because they synchronize the industry with the manufacturing or sometimes industry. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there is a whole chapter of different typologies that are trying to do this. Uh, I see most of these attempts are taking place, I don't know why, in UK and in Canada. Maybe you have an explanation for this, Carl, but uh, I was really looking hard for different uh, cases elsewhere, but most of the cases that we found were there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, and I guess implied in that question too is if we are going to start looking at um, mixed industrial spaces, it in more, more than likely is going to sort of bias certain types of manufacturing or industrial activity. Um, you're not gonna get heavy industry, obviously, you're gonna mostly yeah. have smaller scale, more boutique, local serving, perhaps boutique, um, you know, maker manufacturers and things just because they're not as noisy, they're not as big and so forth. And part of addressing some of those questions is just simply the type of manufacturing that, um, can afford, wants to, and is appropriate for center cities, given the way we've transformed them over the last 20 and 30 years too. Um, but but that's just, yeah, I mean, that's but, uh, just- I, I, I want to emphasize this because I didn't, uh, I usually explain a lot about what we mean uh, when we talk about industry. And again, the book is trying to map the different types of industries and, uh, when we talk about small scale manufacturing, this is one thing. And when we talk about heavy industry, it's another thing. So obviously when we talk about this in chronic typologies, we talk about uh, small scale manufacturing. We talk about storage of goods. We talk about different types of uh, activities that can be integrated in the city, that can enhance compactness, that can uh, follow environmental uh, regulation and could uh, you know, follow this uh, type of idea without damaging the health of the residents. So this is this is the issue. And of course, there are all new attempts. I mean, I think that what the, the book is trying to do is to to follow these new attempts. There is no, uh, I don't have like 20 cases of attempts. I have like five, six new attempts. And some of them also already, already raised different questions. I see that someone asked for the book link. Uh, I think that if you just write New Industrial Urbanism, Rutledge, you will get into the open access um, uh, version, but we can definitely, I can definitely copy the, the link and put it here. Yeah, and I mean, I might pick up on what you're saying there too. And it, um, Kate Shaw has a, quest, a comment really in there um, about um, contemporary industrial zones needing different kinds of zoning. And I, I say that like picks up with what you're saying there with the research we've been doing is, you know, like in Melbourne, we have industrial one, two, three zones. They're all, they're pretty big blanket and permissible. Um, and the reality is there's very different types of industrial activity that need very different kind of planning supports. And I, like, I hear a lot, of, I don't know if you have more to say on that, but just um, it's kind of like a, a yes, definitely to that comment because you can really see that now, especially given what you're talking about. Yeah, and I think that, again, uh, we worked very hard for this book to be open access because we thought that uh, there are not so many books that maps all these strategies. But when you dive to the strategies, obviously, 
clustering uh, at rural areas can afford to host uh, more uh, polluting uh, industries where, you know, hybrid districts are very, very strict in terms of environmental regulation. So the, the, there is relationship between the proximity and the, the typology of the strategy or the, the, the component of the strategy uh, to the location and to the type of industry. So it's a very complex story. I think that my point uh, in the book, but also uh, in, uh, in general, is that we used to think about industry really through a physical zoning dimension, and it's much more complex. It, if we want to be successful to do this shift, we have to think about society, we have to think about management, and the physical dimension is just supporting all these needs and ideas. Thanks. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and throw possibly a tricky question at you from Giselle Osborne. Um, and we'll, we'll see if we can tackle this one. The idea of the ecosystem when applied to urban yeah. environments interests me. In ecological ecosystems are relationships which develop over deep time in specific places. Any thoughts on how planners can provide the seeds for innovation ecosystems in greenfield contexts? Is it even possible in new areas developed from a tabula rasa basis, e.g. in growth areas? So uh, thank you for this question, but because again, uh, you know, I have two hats. I'm both practitioner and a, a, a theorist and a scholar. Um, so I'm trying to implement my ideas now in practice. And the question of ecosystem is not again, just the green and I, I will I will tackle this in a, in a moment, but it's also uh, socially. So for example, again, in the South, I'm developing a new Tabula Rasa uh, industrial area. So in that sense, we are taking very much into account all these ideas uh, and trying to build a system first to be very compact based on uh, existing assets, damage minimally the, the green or the open uh, environment. Not to say that this is uh, easy, but I don't think that uh, 10 years ago, we were thinking about developing industrial ecosystem uh, industrial environment uh, with the concept of ecosystem. So again, and um, there is quite a lot of uh, information in the book about this concept. What does it mean? It's not just about the green. It's also about how the green is being supported, cultivated by uh, other uh, stakeholders. Uh, so it is uh, referring to what you suggested, but it's much more broader. It's ecosystem in the sense that it is using the existing assets building on it with minimum damage to the environment and to the society. And this is, uh, again, it's not in my concept, ecological ecosystem or industrial ecosystem, it's not my uh, concept. In the uh, introduction, we map the key ideas that are associated with industrial uh, development nowadays. We offer the new industrial urbanism, but there is quite a lot of literature about industrial ecosystems. Okay, thank you. I don't you, know Tom. if I answered that, but uh, <laughs> maybe in order to answer that, I will have to present one of the projects that I'm working on, and we can see all these dimensions because, uh, again, the greenfield issue is just one dimension of this uh, issue. Thanks. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, and we're going to have to close off the questions now, but I, I do encourage you to have a look at. Uh, Tali Hatuka's book and, um, you know, reach out to her. I probably shouldn't be doing this, but, you know, we always like to talk about these these subjects. So um, the the discussion's ongoing. Um, I want to thank you for for joining us today and, and join, joining Tali and I, and I want to encourage you to join the other Festival of Future Urbanism events. You can have a, a look at the listing of upcoming events at festivalofurbanism.com. And you can also access recordings of the events in the coming um, days as well. Um, we have another event starting at five o'clock uh, called Filming in the Future City, film competition and documentary film screening. So um, you can join that online and um, 
grab some popcorn and watch some documentary films or run over here if you're with me at Caulfield and over to the auditorium. Um, also, I want to make a plug for another great session from our PhD students tomorrow called Economizing the Economy. It's over at SiteWorks in Brunswick, and this session is going to look at alternative economic models and the implications for the future material and social fabric of our cities. That's tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Um, so with that, thank you again, Tal. It was really wonderful to see you present your work, and um, um, thank hopefully you. we can thank speak you in the near future. Thank you. Thanks Thank very you very much. much. Bye. Bye.